is looking at you, kid. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Get out before I kill you. Hey, wait a minute. Don't you ever think I ain't tough? They are enduring classics of the American film. As American as that grand old flag, yet they're all the work of a Hungarian immigrant. A director as colorful as any character in his pictures, Michael Curtiz. Mr. Curtiz, yeah? Mr. Trent is on the phone again. Tell him to stop calling me. My third no is final. Yes, sir. Curtiz's brief cameo in the 1947 film, It's a Great Feeling, provides one of the few glimpses of the director. But Hollywood lore is full of stories about him, stories that show the striking contrast between the man and his films. He spoke terrible English. His English was always a joke on the set, but the dialogue in his films is wonderfully given and directed. Now, I'm thinking about you, baby. I wish you wouldn't, Jimmy. What? Think about me. What's the matter? I'm liable to catch something hanging out in your mind. Oh, I don't see you for months, and the first thing you do is insult me. Yes, if it's possible. Mike had this heavy accent, and he was very brusque. Do this. Hey, no, no, you know. And, and some of them didn't like that. When he got mad, his he had a bald head, and his, his veins stuck out in his head, and his eyes popped out, and he came right up to my face yelling, God damn you, sir, God damn you, dumb, you dumb, you idiot, you fool, you ruined my picture, my beautiful actress with the greatest scene in the picture, and you stopped the scene, you are dumb, 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 dumb. He could be cruel, overbearing, a bully, yet some of his films were gentle, sensitive, even eight. sentimental. This isn't the kind of job you take for money. It's like being in the army. You'll owe me. Mike was um, a product of what was in uh, Europe. And Warner Brothers brought him over. And he would, they would give him, you know, things like 20,000 years in Sing Sing to Rick. He had no idea. He always called it Zing Zing, you know. What is this Zing Zing, you know? Uh, I think part of it was an act. It was an act that Michael Curtiz played with great style. Born Mihai Kertész in Hungary in the late 1880s, he worked as an actor and film director in various European capitals. Warner Brothers president, Harry Warner, saw a biblical epic Kertész had made in Austria and brought him to America in 1926. Noah's Ark, one of Kertész's early productions at Warner's, established him as the studio's answer to Cecil B. DeMille. It was also Hollywood's first experience with Curtiz's almost maniacal determination to get the shot at any cost. The flood scenes were spectacular, but there were many injuries due to lack of adequate safety precautions, and it was rumored that at least one extra died. But Curtiz proved too versatile to be limited to a single genre, and during the transition to talking films, he became one of Warner Brothers' most reliable all-purpose directors. He showed off his European visual flair in a couple of horror films made in early two-strip Technicolor. Synthetic flesh. Hello, Mr. Van. Why, Sergeant? while also capably handling a more American style and American style actors. I'd like to kiss you, but I just washed my hair. Bye. Hello. Hello, Louis, come in yet? And he always called me Talbot. He said, Talbot, now you come when I don't say stand still. Well, I had to say, come when he doesn't say stand still. I don't want to ask him, what does it mean? It only means to come, but he puts on and don't stand still, you know? Like the, you know, bring in the empty horses, you know, the horses that weren't mounted. As Curtiz's reputation for consistently excellent work grew, so did his reputation for extravagant temperament. He threw his weight around. He was famous for being European, autocratic, bullying, cruel, sarcastic, scathing to the actors. And yet everyone loved telling Michael Curtiz's stories. And I think like being in Curtiz's films, because he put on a show himself, and because almost always, Katie's films were successful. All right, my hearties, follow me! One of Curtiz's most successful and most antagonistic collaborations was with Errol Flynn. Curtiz gave Flynn his big break in Captain Blood, but Flynn resented Curtiz's arrogant manner and dangerous ways. 
Flynn even swore that Curtis took the safety tips off the swords used in fight scenes. Did I upset your plans? You've come to Nottingham once too often. When this is over, my friend, there'll be no need for me to come again. Flynn and Curtis battled their way through 10 films, reinventing the swashbuckler and giving it new vigor and a new romantic team. Olivia de Havilland was often the lady in Flynn's arms, both of them responding to such Curtis directions as, crush her, maybe you break her ribs, that is all right if we get a good scene. But there were even greater dangers in those movies. During the filming of The Charge of the Light Brigade, Curtis once again scandalized the industry with his disregard for the safety of men and animals. One man was killed, and many horses had to be destroyed due to injuries caused by the use of trip wires. But the outcry didn't hurt the box office, and Curtis added to his reputation as one of the screen's most skilled craftsmen. He knew camera. Boy, did he know camera. When you see the things that, that you've done with him, you think, oh boy, was he right. There was no other way to do that scene but that way, for the camera, you know? Curtis not only knew the camera, he knew talent. He may have been tough on actors, but he brought out the best in them. Besides Flynn and de Havilland, he also promoted the careers of other newcomers. John Garfield in Four Daughters. You think they let me win? Who? Hey. The fates, the destinies, whoever they are that decide what we do or don't get. Doris Day in Romance on the High Seas. Curtis guided James Cagney to two of his best performances in Angels with Dirty Faces and in his Oscar-winning role as the Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yankee Doodle Dandy, Yankee Doodle Dandy. And Joan Crawford was always grateful to Curtis for tearing off her shoulder pads, scrubbing off her makeup, and drawing out an Oscar-worthy performance in Mildred Pierce. I took the only job I could get so you and your sister could eat and have a place to sleep and some clothes on your backs. Aren't the pies bad enough? Did you have to degrade us? Peter, don't talk like that. I'm really not surprised. You've never spoken of your people, who you came from, so perhaps it's natural. Maybe that's why, Father... <gasps> but for millions of movie fans, the essence of movie acting, indeed movie making, is contained in a single word, Casablanca. Sam, I thought I told you never to play. Casablanca, the film that became Michael Curtiz's biggest triumph was also his biggest challenge. Shooting began without a final script and with some key roles not yet cast. Nobody even knew how it would end until the day they shot the final scene. That it worked so well is in large part due to Michael Curtiz's skill and perfectionism. He won his only Oscar for directing Casablanca. You're the top, you're the Coliseum. There would be much more to come from this brilliant director in the 40s and 50s, but it's the memorable performances, epic sweep, and breathtaking imagery of his greatest films that would ensure his reputation. Michael Curtiz is the classic example of a studio director in that he could turn his hand to almost anything. He could go from any genre to another. And somehow, this Hungarian knew exactly how those genres worked. So there was some innate storytelling skill in this man. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Half a dozen stiffs and a strange medical discovery set newspaper man Lee Tracy on the trail of a murderer in the Michael Curtiz thriller, Dr. X. Thursday at 1.30 a.m., part of TCM's 24-hour Summer Under the Star salute to Lee Tracy.